for himself as well. And so you don't get actually justified. You get a portion of that, but that also has to continue out through your whole life. And then at that point, you'll get the final de declaration that you're saved. And it's very dangerous because what's taking place is it is works is what it is all about. That's what they're trying to say. And what we want you to understand is this simple portion of justification is a what well, we're going to use the word forensic. It's, it's, a, it's a legal declaration by God. And the problem that we experience today and the mixture between Protestantism and Catholicism is Catholicism says it is justification, but it is also plus works that ultimately save you. And the problem is they take justification and sanctification, which is a different topic, and they pull them all together. And it gets completely confusing. Well, this is where Martin Luther, the reformer, when he was reading the scriptures, reading the book of Romans in the first chapter, that the righteousness that we have comes from Christ, he realized that this justification, this act, this forensic act of God where he declares you to be righteous is not done by works, but rather the agency or the means by which he does it is through faith. And that was the split between Roman Catholics and what later on, because we protested against them, we became Protestants. And that happened in the 1500s. Uh, late 14, 1500s. And so that has been the standard of church difference between Protestantism and Catholicism is the idea and the understanding of justification and where we stand. So if you got your hand out, follow with me. I'm going to begin here and just simply say, how do we gain a right legal standing? So remember, as we've talked about the doctrine of salvation, we've talked about the election of God where he chooses you. We've talked about being called as an invitation and responding to that invitation. We've talked about regeneration, the very act where he makes you born again. We've talked about not only regeneration, but conversion, which is both faith and repentance. We use the illustration faith and repentance as being two sides two different sides to the same coin. They can't be separated. And the problem that we have today in the declaration of the gospel is we preach a repentantless gospel. We don't even bring up the topic of sin. We don't do anything like this because it's going to offend the person. So we offer them Jesus Christ, and they say today, just believe in him, trust in him. Everything's going to be great, and you don't have to worry about what you're doing or your lifestyle or what you're involved in. And we have to understand that repentance doesn't mean that you earn favor with God, but you are willing to surrender whatever sin is in your life to stand before God and declare that he is Lord and put your faith and trust in him. After that is done, you begin that journey, that process of becoming more like Jesus Christ in the process of sanctification. So repentance doesn't save you, but it's important that you understand that it's having the right disposition towards sin. If God tells you something that you need to do through his word, you need to be willing to obey it. And today when the gospel is preached, we don't even talk about sin at all. And it's so sad because we're seeing the effects of it, and the effects of it are people who think they're believers, but they're really not believers. We're seeing complete abandonment of the faith today. So... Let's look at this, drop down to the uh, bold print on the third paragraph here. And when it says here, God actually declares our sin to be forgiven, this must be a legal declaration concerning our relationship to God's laws, stating that we are completely forgiven and no longer liable for punishment. That's a, that's a fantastic truth right there. Because justification is a doctrine that not only starts the moment you begin your Christian life, you continually are justified throughout your whole life until the day you stand before him, he will declare, you are mine, enter into my kingdom. So a right understanding of justification is absolutely critical to the whole Christian faith. And then look at this, once Martin Luther, that's the reformer, realized the truth of justification by faith alone, 
He spiritually became a born-again Christian and overflowed with newfound joy. In his, in his uh, uh, works, you'll see that the phrase that he uses is like that heaven's doors sprung open and I stepped through them. So the primary issue in the Protestant Reformation was a dispute with the Roman Catholic Church over justification. If we're to safeguard the truth of the gospel for future generations, we must understand the truth of justification. So look at this. Even today, a true view of justification is a dividing line between biblical gospel of salvation by faith alone. Now remember, we say by faith alone, but then we follow that phrase by saying, but it's by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. So it's by faith alone, and all false gospels are all false gospels of salvation based on good works. Justification is not based on your works at all. It's a, we're going to call it a forensic act of God where he declares you righteous. So if you looked at Romans chapter 8 and we began what we called the golden chain, you remember that? Those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he what? Glorified, yeah. So when we looked at the previous chapter, called here refers to effective calling, where he calls you, he awakens you to the gospel. This includes regeneration. I use the expression, he jiggles the will, and therefore he moves us, and we are then born again. But after effective calling and response that initiates our part, the next step of the application of redemption is justification. And you got to remember, go to page two, this is something that God does himself. You can't justify yourself. This is an act of God. Paul says quite clearly, and he teaches this, that our faith and as God's, as God's, our justification comes after our faith as God's response to our faith. And then in Romans 3.26, the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So he's going to give some good scriptures here that you need to know about. Since we have been justified, how? By faith, right? We now have peace with God, Romans 5.1. And then also Galatians 2.16, a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So you can't work for it. So I was doing a, a memorial service yesterday for a lady who had passed away, an old timer that uh, was part of the uh, daughters of Paso Robles. She grew up in this area and their family were homesteaders and I asked them the question I said do you think I'm going to heaven well they're, they're you know they're, they're nodding their head yeah 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 why am I going to heaven well you're a pastor and, and if you're not going to heaven what chance do any of us have to go into heaven and I explained that that is really an erroneous understanding because you're basically saying that as a pastor I must be doing some kind of good works that merits me my salvation, and so therefore I'm going to heaven. And I've reminded them that it has nothing to do with what I do for work. It has nothing to do with my good works. It has to do with the fact that God has declared me righteous. That's the only way we're going to get there, if God declares you righteous. So don't start comparing ourselves to different people, but rather compare ourselves to God. I talked to a person who was a prison guard, and when I was trying to explain sin to this person, this prison guard, and I was sharing Christ with him, and I got to the place and the point where it says, the Bible says we're all sinners, he just nearly exploded in my face. I said, what's the matter? He said, I'm not like those people, and he's referring to the prisoners. I'm not like them, because in his mind, he equates a sinner with somebody who has broken the law of the land and has been incarcerated, so therefore, they're not a good person, therefore, they're going to hell. And I explained to the person, it is not based upon whether they're in jail or not. 
It's based upon justification by faith and what Christ can do for you. And believe it or not, you're just as bad as that person is. Of course, that really blows their mind. Like, they'll start saying, I never murdered anybody. I never killed anybody. I never robbed or raped anybody. No, you may not have done that. But you are a sinner and the word that we use to talk about sin is sin has been imputed to you through your great, 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 great grandfather, Adam. And Adam, who fell in sin, now the whole race has fallen in sin. And let me tell you something. You're a sinner, not only because of Adam's imputed sin to you, but you sin as well. You see, in his mind, he was looking and grading our relationship with God on a curve, right? You ever been to a classroom? I used to love it when they would grade on a curve and they put the numbers on the board and they say, okay, anybody who got from here to here, you get an A and then a B and then a C. But God doesn't grade on a curve, does he? You are either righteous before his eyes or you're not. Now, you may have done terrible things in your life that are worse than other people have done, but that's not gonna get you into heaven. Your Aunt Bessie may be a wonderfully good person and she may go to church and she may do a lot of good acts in her community, but the only way to get to heaven is to have God remove your sin, declare you righteous so that when he looks at you, he is not looking at your sin, but he is looking at the righteousness of his son, Jesus. That's it. Without that, you're not going to get there. Without you being clothed in his righteousness, we will never get to glory. And that's the difference. So what is justification? Look at page two. Is that on the back side? I think that's back side, right? It's an instantaneous legal act in which God, right, first of all, thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us and second, declares us to be righteous in his sight. You know, I was reading in my devotions this week, Mark chapter 2, and it's where Jesus heals the paralytic. And if you remember the story, Jesus is teaching, and he's in a house, and the house is jammed with people. There's no way they can get into the house to hear him. I imagine they're standing by the windows, they're standing in the entryway, wherever they can get to hear Jesus teach. And these paralytics is carried by four of his friends and they come in and they're looking at how are we going to get Jesus out here or how are we going to get him in there to see Jesus so their plan is would go to the top of the roof and lower him in through the roof now I know that sounds kind of weird to us but think of a roof as a patio because that's how they lived in those days they didn't build out a patio. They went on top of the roof. In fact, in the cool of the day or in the evening, they would often go to the top of the roof because it's way too hot inside the house. And so they go on top of this roof. They begin to move the tiles. And I can just imagine Jesus standing there teaching. And there's nothing worse when you're teaching it to have some distraction going on that everybody turns their head and looks at the distraction. And I, of course, Jesus knows what's going on, but I'm sure he stops and he looks up at the roof and here comes this guy. He's being lowered down. And when he comes all the way down in the presence of Jesus and he's standing there, what does Jesus say? Your sins are forgiven. Now, I'm thinking about it from the perspective of the paralytic. Think about that for a minute. Do you think for a moment that when he was lowered through the roof, he was thinking to himself, oh, good, I'm going to see Jesus and my sins are going to be forgiven. I think he's thinking, oh, good, I'm going to get to see Jesus and I'm going to walk out of here. I'm sure he's looking at all the other people in the room and he's going, see these people with legs that work? I want to be like them. They have happy, fulfilled lives. My life is not spent in an electric wheelchair. They got to carry me everywhere. I can't do anything on my own. I am totally dependent upon other people. And as I look around and I see all these people who've gathered together, the first thing that maybe comes to his mind is, I want to be like them. And the very first thing that Jesus does is he forgives his sins. What's going on? 
I mean, if I was that guy, the follow-up would question would be, that's wonderful, but when do I get my use of my legs? Because that's why we did all this. Well, if you read the bigger picture of the story, it's a setup because Jesus is going to afterwards heal him, make him walk, and then say, which is easier, to have your sins forgiven or to say, rise up and walk? And at that time, in the language that he's using there in Mark 2, he's declaring his lordship. He's declaring that he and the Father are one, and he has the power to forgive sins. You just saw me heal this man. But that man did not realize, I don't think, that the most important thing in his life is to have your sins forgiven. And I think so often when we present the gospel, here's how it goes. Don't you want to be happy? Don't you want to be prosperous? Don't you want people to like you? Don't you want to have good relationships? Don't you want your business to prosper? Well, come to Jesus and he'll do that. Listen, if Jesus Christ has declared me righteous in his eyes and he never did another thing for me in the rest of my life, I have everything I ever need in life. There's nothing else more important than knowing my sins are forgiven, that he has declared me righteous. So we often present the gospel, I think, in an appropriate way because the gospel is Christ forgives sin. You got to A, recognize you're a sinner. B, you got to place your trust and faith in him and you need to repent of your sin. That doesn't mean become perfect. It's the beginning of our sanctification. But he gets my whole life. And that's not what I hear today being preached at the gospel. I hear everything positive about what you're going to get when you get to become a Christian but that's not why we come to Christ we come to Christ because we're in need of a savior because we are are in need to be forgiven that's the most important thing and I try to emphasize that so when I did this memorial yesterday I had this distraction taking place. Two elderly gentlemen were sitting over here on a bench and they were talking loud. And as I am preaching or sharing the gospel with those who have come, they start to look at me and then they all turn and start looking at what their conversation is. So you, in something like that, you just, I kind of just stopped. I just kind of looked over there to let them know. I see you, please shut up. <laughs> then they realize, oh, we're too loud. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, look at this. Justification is an instantaneous legal act. He thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness and belonging now to us, and he declares us to be righteous. That's the most important fact right there. So, I'm going to... Focus in on this number two, declares us to be righteous, and then we'll come back to how God thinks about our sin. So, next paragraph, the reason for treating these items in reverse order that I'm telling you about here is that the word justification and related terms of the second half of the definition a legal or the legal declaration of God, but are also passages that show that this declaration is based on the fact that God thinks of our righteousness and belonging to us. So both aspects must be treated. Even though in the New Testament, justification focuses on the legal declaration of God. See, there's something that's incredible that happens. It's not just that your sins are wiped away. It's that they're wiped away and the righteousness of Christ is now given to you and imputed to you. It's reckoned to your account. Sometimes when I ask people to define justification, they use this clever term, and it's a clever phrase, just as I have, you know, justification is nothing more than when God looks at me, he looks at me just as I have never sinned. And there's a part of that that's correct, but there's a part of it that's completely inaccurate because justification, if God, if you've never sinned, that doesn't get you into heaven what, hap- what gets you into heaven is the absolute righteousness and perfection of Christ that has to be given to you. 
And so that's the vital thing that must take place in this exchange. So look at it. Number A, justification includes a legal declaration by God. The use of the word justify in the Bible indicates that a legal or that a justification is a legal declaration by God. So in your Old Testament translation, that you word dekuo is used there to declare righteous. That's a Greek word, but that would come from your Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, you get the word sadik, which is the term for righteousness. When they heard this, all the people and the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. That's in Luke's gospel. Of course, the people, the tax collectors, did not make God righteous. That's obvious. That would be impossible. Rather, they declared God to be righteous. So you see how the word is being used here, to declare. Romans 4, 5, to the one who does not work, of course it's all good. Talk about distractions. <laughs> let's, let's all stare Chuck down. The one who does not work, that's so significant, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as what? Righteousness. We can also say Abraham believed God and it was what? Reckoned unto him, credited unto him as righteousness. Here Paul makes the ungodly to be righteous by change not excuse me <clears throat> by changing them internally and making them morally perfect for they would have merit or have to have works on their own to depend upon it rather he means that God declares the ungodly to be righteous in his sight not on the basis of their good works but in response to their faith the idea that justification is a legal declaration is quite also evident when Paul says, who is going to bring any charge against God's elect? You can't bring any charge against them. Why? Because the righteousness they possess is the righteousness of Christ, and no charge can be brought against Christ. And if Christ is yours, and he has imputed to you his righteousness, then you stand legally declared righteous before God and no charge can be brought against you. And that's a, that's a legal term. No charge can be against you. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who justifies? Who is to condemn? To, de to condemn someone is to declare that person guilty. The opposite of condemnation is what? Justification. So it's so beautiful because God now declares me as having the righteousness of Christ, and so therefore Christ takes my judgment. Bold print down at the bottom. Such a declaration of guilt cannot stand in the face of God's declaration of righteousness. And then that little last paragraph, the word justify in the Greek dekuo, and uh, it's in uh, Sadiq in the Old Testament often used in the Hiphil case. So question, let me stop right here for a moment. No questions, you all perfectly understand justification by faith. Mm -hmm. Well, anytime the word sadiq is used in the Old Testament, they took the Old Testament translated it into Greek from the Hebrew language. And so anywhere in that Old Testament that word sadiq is used, it is translated in Greek as dekuo, righteousness. And it happens in many passages. Uh, you'll get some here in Proverbs and different places like that. Yeah, Warren. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we definitely do. So in the Catholic system of understanding justification, you know, you have your faith here, but they say that is not enough to get you into heaven, so you have to add another dimension, which is works. So you got faith plus works, But here's what they also say on top of that. Your works are not enough. Your faith is not enough. We got to add over here. Do you know what we're talking about? It's not transcendental meditation, but that's the treasury of merits. So Mother Mary has lived such a holy and a perfect life that she's got extra credits over here. She just is just filled with all kinds of, she got every A, she was absolutely perfect. She's got so much holiness and righteousness in her that if you don't have enough here and you don't have enough here, you can borrow from here and it can be transferred back to here in the treasury of merits so that you have, not a, you have now enough faith to get in, Right? That's the understanding of how Roman Catholicism works. And so you can see the works tied to it. Because in one sense, think about it, if I'm doing some kind of a work, it gives me a certain amount of confidence that I have faith and that I'm saved and I'm assured because I just gave $10,000 to the church. But $10,000 isn't going to cut it. And you get caught up in this cycle. This is what I call a, you know, the work cycle. And it just goes around and around and around and around. And you never actually ever get off the horse. That's why during the Reformation, when Tetzel, uh, one of the Roman Catholic priests, was going around build, saving and uh, trying to get money for building these great cathedrals, he said this. He said, every coin that drops into the coffer, a soul from purgatory is freed. That was their fundraising campaign. That's, those, those cathedrals are elaborate. And that's the vicious cycle that you get in. And what Jesus is saying is, no, no. You put your faith and your trust in Christ And that's all you need. But that's hard to visualize at times because we do sin. And when I sin, isn't it, don't we say after we sin, I must not be saved. I've sinned again. I did it. I I told God I never would do that again. In fact, I told God, kill me if I do that again. And I'm walking around and he hasn't killed me yet. So I'm not, I must not be saved. But no, we have to believe in what Christ has done for us and believe that he is enough. That's why he says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You can't pull it off. But the only way that I can do this is get Christ's righteousness given to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a good point. Believe, not behave. Although, if you truly are a Christian, you will eventually get to the point of correct behavior, but that's not going to save you, right? Yeah, sanctification. So this is where we say faith will equal works. Faith without works is dead. So the nature of what James is saying in the book of James is the true nature of saving faith is a faith that works. They go together, and he uses Abraham as an example. He uses others as an example, and he's letting us know if you just have faith and you have no works at all, you need to really question whether you got faith or you got saved at all. 
But faith will eventually equal good works. Stop and think about the thief on the cross for a moment. There's a guy who's dying. There's a guy in just a few minutes. Talk about being in the fourth quarter of his life. He's down to the two-minute drill, right? This guy's going to die. Now, does he have any time to express good works? Trick question. Trick question. Trick question. What does he turn and say to his friend? This man's done nothing wrong. He rebukes his friend. That man gave a public testimony to this day that is louder, more confident, more people know about it than your testimony. That man displayed the glorious transformation of a man who was saved by God's grace and declared righteous. And every time you read the Bible and you come to that passage, you're looking at a guy and his testimony, his sin. What was his declaration? We're here. We're thieves. We what? We deserve this. There's the sin. And then remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then the glorious assurance, today you shall be with me in paradise. Wow, incredible. Yeah. Grace alone. Right. But this is where, you know, that's why the Roman Catholics got this whole system going. And they will ask you, when have you been to your last confession? That's the general question they always ask you. Have have any of you gone to a confessional? Okay. All right. Got it. So you understand, you get to understand their whole system here. Okay, where do I leave off? It, well, any other questions? Uh, yeah, Dan. Yes. Doesn't count them. Well, the the idea there is not that he doesn't know the number of your sins or what you've done. The idea of that removal is never to bring them up against you and charge you with you. They are removed by the sacrifice of Christ and the blood that satisfies the judgment of God. It's a legal document, yeah, right? It's, it's, yeah. Yes. Right. So you got, you got what you're pointing out is double imputation. I get his righteousness. He gets my sin. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. That makes sense? Dale? Yeah, uh, the word bad situation is uh, really compared to the good bad situation that they, they still think that they can get their way by works. Well, that's a good, I'm, that's a good question because it, it, well, but look, but look at contemporary Judaism today. It's all over the place. I mean, I think it was you, Warren, that was telling me a story about a, a, a somebody who had become a rabbi, and the question was, does he believe in God? I was thinking, you know, I, are you kidding me? <laughs> but that, that was the question, does he believe in God? Because there are some rabbis who don't believe in God. So now, let me, I should probably make this clear. So, so this is the Catholic system of how you get to heaven. Uh, Council of Trent, uh, 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 1545 to, oops, five, to uh, 53. I think that's right. Check me on that. This is, and it was held in Trent, and this is the discussion of what they were doing on. This is a response 
to Martin Luther, and this is the system that they have held to. Now, though this is the Catholic system, that doesn't mean that all Catholics understand this, and it doesn't mean that all Catholics believe this, but this is what they're taught. I have met some Catholic priests, too, that I became friends with, who basically told me, this is garbage. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That's what your system says. He says, no, I, I'm much more closer to the Protestant system of justification by faith than I am by works. You know, I about had a heart attack. <laughs> but when I was at uh, the mission a number of years ago, the, oh, no, I'm sorry, at St. Rose, that's where I was. Is that what it is, St. Rose? St. Rose. I was there doing a funeral. Uh, they had, he had asked me to come to participate with it, and of course, you know, they do all their rigmarole and all their special bowing and everything you can think of. And I said, so I'm going to preach. What do I prove? You know, what, what, I don't want to offend you. I realize I'm a guest here. You know what he said to me? He said, you preach the gospel and you preach justification by faith. I just about couldn't believe it. But I was praising God because I found a guy. And so I said, so I asked the obvious question, why are you still a Catholic priest? I mean, are you in it for the retirement program or what? (laughs) He did say this. He says, the good thing about where I am right now is that I can tell people justification by faith and have an influence upon Catholicism that nobody else, unless they believe what I believe, will have on them. And I was like, praise God. Man. So don't don't fall into the trap of thinking that everybody who is Catholic believes this and everybody who is Catholic has an understanding of this. You, you have a great discussion to begin with somebody who's Catholic and you're evangelizing them to ask them, how do you get to heaven? How, how does that work? What do you need to do? Then as they begin to outline what they think they need to do, that's where you can come in with the word of God and say, okay, let me show you in this passage in Romans what the Apostle Paul says. Read it with me and tell me what you think that that means. And I have found Catholic friends that don't believe that. Amazing. So Roman Catholicism doctrine won't get you to heaven. Will we see Roman Catholics in heaven? Yep. Because there'll be Catholics who have believed, haven't believed this way, but their true faith and trust is in Christ. So very, very much you could say, Some Catholics will be there in heaven. And the new theology, as I said before, with N.T. Wright, uh, is taking Catholicism, Protestant, and Jewish faith, all three, and blending an idea of justification that contains works and contains sanctification. And that gets you into heaven because we all become one people of God, the people of God, just like in the Old Testament. We all become the people of God and we, gain, and we get to heaven. That's a real popular. And N.T. Wright has a lot of books out there. He's a very well-educated and smart man. And you ought to see his book contract that he has. It's amazing. And he's a very good writer. Um, but I think he has a very deficient view of justification by faith. Anybody ever heard of N.T. Wright? Okay, no, okay. No, 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 no. Church of England, yeah. I've been, bab- I was sprinkled Church of England. I was born in England and they, on me. So I got all my bases covered. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> and I, and then, then once a week I go out for confession out there. At, I got it, I'm in. Art. Mm-hmm. No, 
if there's a Catholic who is born again, right, and has, in fact, have you ever seen the Renew movement? Sometimes you'll see uh, an element of called Renew. They'll, they'll be like an oak tree, and then it'll say Renew on a Catholic church. That is a charismatic element that has entered into the church. And some of them believe just simply in justification by faith. They do have good works, but I don't think that their good works get them to heaven. So you can have bad theology and still go to heaven. That's entirely possible. Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that when you look at my theology, there, there's going to be something that's wrong that I'm not saying right or a passage that I'm not quite understanding. But that isn't going to send me to hell unless I mess up the gospel really bad. That <laughs> yeah, okay. What else, gentlemen? All right. Go ahead, Neil, quick. Yes. A retired priest. And he, he just uh, wow, that's interesting. Amazing. All right. Yeah. Yeah, but it actually it actually started to get wobbly uh, about the 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 uh, third and fourth century. And then from then on, Catholicism got really wobbly and it got worse and worse and worse and it ended up where it is in the Council of Trent here at this time. I mean, they totally lost the idea of justification by faith. I mean... Uh, that's a good question on the... Uh, a, a pseudopigrapha or apocryphal literature that was added. I'm not sure when, when it was actually inserted into the canon, but if you get their Bible, you'll open it up and you'll see a middle, middle section. Their, their Bible's called the Reims Douai Version. It was done in Reims, France, and it has the apocryphal li literature, First and Second Maccabees and different books like that. Um, so th they, that's where they did begin to insert all kinds of things that were outside of the canon. And then when the church, when the church gave the Pope the right to, to issue a papal bull or to speak ex cathedra, in other words, he speaks for God, I mean, he's got the right to say whatever he wants to say, and that becomes Catholic dogma. And that's what's tragic, because in the Catholic faith, rather than having Scripture, the Word of God, I, I always abbreviate Word of God as WOG, Word of God. Instead of having that as supreme authority, they say the church is supreme authority and it has the ability to therefore explain God's Word to you because you can't understand it, so they preach it to the people. And so it's no longer God's Word over what I say, but it's this is what I say God's words under me. Now, please understand, this is at a time when, you know, your, your printing press didn't come out to the late 1400s, so they didn't even have Bibles. You, you know, most of the people there lived in an agrarian society, you didn't even know how to read and write. That's one thing that the Jews did so well, is they taught their children to read. They taught their children the law. They were educated people. They cared for their own. But this history... Uh, in Catholicism was keep them dumb, keep them fat, keep them ignorant, keep them working, and keep them putting money in. Yeah. Yeah. Very, right. 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 Yeah, Roman, yeah, it was called the, uh, not Together for the Gospel, that's Don Carson and uh, Tim Keller and John Piper. Uh, that was called Romans and Catholics Together for something. 
can't remember what it was called, but it was trying to build unity in the church. See, some of the things in Roman Catholicism, like their understanding of who Jesus Christ is, you know, and their understanding of the Trinity, it's, there, there's some good stuff there, some good thinkers that have put that down. But this, this whole idea with Mary and the treasury of merits and all that, it just got wobbly, it completely. Yeah, unless there was unless there were some that were literate, had scriptures, had read it, and come to a different understanding of it. Right. Yeah. He 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 gets the credit for it because he nailed the ninety five thesis on the wall, and you know he's the guy who stuck the stake in the ground. Parts of it. Yeah. So, yeah, he was, he was protesting the Sisters of Indulgence. You've seen that group? Perpetual. Oh, Perpetual. That oh, just grieves my heart. I, I am no longer a Dodger fan after that. I just said, I'm sorry. I cannot handle that. And I, I, don't, I don't understand that because it, it's insulting to Catholics. And why would you do that? You, it's okay to disagree, but you're insulting them. But they're losing money. <laughs> I just like, oh, how much money has Budweiser lost? Whew. <laughs> it's just funny money is all it is all right yes Fred I'm sorry yeah Yeah, you, you want to give them God's word. That's what I love about, uh, you know, our Awana or our vacation Bible school. Kids are going to learn truth. They're going to get, they're going to memorize scripture. That's why you bring your Bible to church, you know, learn God's word. All right. Let, yeah. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it did. Yeah, good. Thank you, Don. Glenn. On justification by faith? Oh, okay. <laughs> let, me get, let me get my poor box out here. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, 
Know your audience. If you're going to share the gospel, who are you sharing the gospel with? If you're sharing the gospel with a Catholic, I don't start off here. You know where I start off? Take a guess. Starts with a G or J. (laughs) Start off with Jesus. That they understand. I don't have to start with creation. They believe God created the world. They believe Jesus. But then we go from there and begin to move into how are you really saved? Do you really know this? See, Catholicism is bound up in rituals, right? The mass is the re-sacrificing and the re-offering of Christ over and over and over again. Every time there's a mass, he's re-sacrificed. But we can begin to really understand where they are by asking them, how, how will you get to heaven? What, what do you think? What will, what will make you right before God? If they start explaining this, then you start explaining this. And the book of Romans, chapter four. Man, nail it, nail it well. Good, all right, let's try to, it's, we got a few more minutes. Are you guys bored? No, okay. You're not, okay, well, as long as, long as you're not bored, Trent, then we'll keep going, all right. <laughs> Amen, brother, Amen. Oh, good. I I haven't heard of her, but check it out, right? So the top of page four, did I, how far did I get down? I don't, I don't know. Go to the very top. Justify justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, Deuteronomy 25.1. There's the NSB. Now, in this case, justify must mean declare the righteous or, uh, or not guilty, just as condemn means to declare the guilty. Now, follow his reasoning. It would make no sense to say justify here means to make someone good internally. And that's what the Roman Catholics teach, that when you are justified, you are now sanctified at the same time. But it doesn't work, and it's not scripture. Sanctification is different than justification. For judges simply and uh, do not and cannot make people to be good on the inside. Nor does a judge act of condemning a wicked person to be evil on the inside. It simply declares that the person is guilty with respect to a particular crime that has been brought before the court. Similarly, Job refuses to say that his comforts are right. Comforters are right in what they say. Verse, what do I got here, 27? Far be it from me that I should declare you right. The same Hebrew word here is the word for justified, sadiq. The same idea is found in Proverbs. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both like an abomination to the Lord. Here the idea of legal declaration is explicitly strong. Look at this very carefully. Certainly it is not to be an abomination To the Lord to justify, meaning to make someone good or righteous on the inside. In that case, justify the wicked would be very good thing in God's sight. But if justify here means to declare to be righteous, then it's perfectly clear why he who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. See, if you declare the wicked as being good, that's an abomination. And that's kind of where we are as a country, aren't we? We take everything that is wicked and we say it's good and it's all in the name of love. That makes me sick. Again, justify must mean to declare to be righteous, right? That's what we're talking about. Go to the next page, page five. It's important to emphasize that the legal declaration in itself does not change our internal nature. You may have questions about that. Why doesn't it change our internal nature? Because in the order of salvation, regeneration begins the process of changing our internal nature. And you have to remember that when we get saved, all of these things come together in a nanosecond. All we're doing 
is systematically laying it out in terms of the order, but it all happens. But in terms of justification, that's not when your nature is changed. It's rechanged in regeneration. In this sense, justify God issues a legal declaration about us. This is why theologians have also said that justification is forensic, where the word forensic means having to do with legal proceedings. And I'm going to close with this little illustration here by John Murray. He has a little book. It's not a big one. It's a small one. Uh, it might be a little hard to read. It was written in, I think, 60... Is it footnoted? Footnote 55. But great little book. And it's just called Redemption Accomplished and Applied. One of the first books I, I read in Christian faith. Listen to this. Regeneration is an act of God in us. Justification is a judgment of God with respect to us. The distinction, the distinction is that like of a distinction between the act of a surgeon and the act of a judge. The surgeon removes the inward cancer, that is, it does something inside of us. That's not what the judge does. The judge, he gives a verdict regarding your judicial status. If we're innocent, he declares us accordingly. If justification is confused with regeneration or sanctification, then the door is open for the perversion of the gospel at its center. Justification is still the article of the standing or falling of the church. Amen to that. Okay. Any last questions before we get about our Saturdays? All right. Let me, yeah, Don. Yeah. Right. Although the Bible does speak of salvation in past, we're saved, we're being saved, and eventually we will be saved from sin. So that's talking about justification, sanctification, glorification. So, all right, let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, the words of your word, and I thank you for justification by faith, Father, because we couldn't pull it off. I'm glad I'm free from the works cycle, but I'm also glad, Lord, that now that I am a believer, I can serve you and work for you with the right motivation of heart. I pray for those of us who are know and have friends that are Roman Catholic. Lord, may we not just seek to uh, condemn, but may we reach out to them with the gospel and explain to them the love of God and what he has done and how he has saved us free from works. And may you prosper that as we share Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming, guys. So we'll meet. What we're going to do is we're going to meet again. Went out. There it is. Okay. So not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday, we'll meet, and then we're going to take a break in July and August for our summertime stuff. People got a lot of stuff, vacations going on, and then we'll kick back up in the fall. Okay?